Subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man. Yeah, man, it's going down. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. We are here. Y'all see the location, so that means there's something special going on, man. Today's guest, this is actually a, a bucket list guest for me, man. I have a list of certain people that I want to interview before it's all said and done. And, uh, man, it's an honor and a pleasure to have today's guest in the building, man. He is a community activist. He is a religious leader. He is a role model. He is a father. This man is Quanell X. How you doing, man? I am doing well, dear brother. Good evening to you, your listening audience. Good evening to your staff that works with you that are here tonight and those that are not here that work with you and support you. I greet all of you in the greeting words of peace, vassalam alaikum, and in the words of the black liberation struggle for freedom, justice, and equality, black power only means black people power people organized working, economic redevelopment, hmm. and economic resurrection for the black nation. So it indeed is an honor to be sitting here with you, dear brother. I've heard so much about your show, primarily from my nephews and uh, the young ones of the family have told me a lot about you. I was able to get information from them before I came to sit down with you and do some type of study on your show and what you do. I congratulate you to be such a young man who've made such an impact at such a young age so quickly. Stay focused, brother, and in spite of when everything may go away around you, no matter who it is or what it is, always stay focused, brother, and God will make you very successful. Man, I, I appreciate that, man. That, that, that means a lot. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm extremely honored. Um, because people, people are watching this, and, you know, my interviews, we usually on the couch, we're in the studio kicking it. You know, it's a little different setup, man. Can you talk a little bit about the new Black Panthers? And I was going to wait on this, but people are probably watching like, damn, this is, this is pretty intense. Can you tell me a little bit about the new Black Panthers, what you guys are about? And the, just, new uh, Black, the new Black Panther Party was originated first by Aaron Michaels in Dallas, Texas. But then Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, the former national spokesman and former national supreme captain for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, agreed to take over the new Black Panthers. And then Brother Khaled reached out to me as one of the brothers that he wanted to make as one of the founding Central Committee members of the new Black Panther Party to build the party, establish the party across the nation and throughout the black diaspora. And so I salute the eternal leader of the new Black Panther Party, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. And once he passed and made his transition, I felt it was best because of internal disagreements with some that I start the new Black Panther Nation because I knew at some point, as Brother Collett said to me, we would have to die being a party and be born a nation. Hmm. And so I'm only fulfilling in the new Black Panther Nation that which Dr. Collett, Brother Minister Collett Abdul Muhammad, instructed and told me to do. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell me, um, and we, we're going to get into a lot. Um, but can you tell me, because your son right now, you got a son who's killing it in football, from my understanding. You got a, a tremendous high school football <laughs> player. Can you tell me a little bit about that? One of the top uh, recruits in the nation uh, right now, right? Little Q is good. Little Q is well. Little Quanell is focused. Uh, we started training and developing him when he was eight years old. I never wanted to play football. I actually wanted to play baseball. 
But uh, was this was this something that you were into? Were you in football as a kid, or you were you were sport? Into it, like well, my brother Quincy and I played little league football together, and uh, we played little league baseball together. But I wanted my son, little Quanil, if he was going to play a sport, to play baseball because to me, baseball was less dangerous. They made more money, and here you didn't even have to be in shape to make moves. You could just show up and be on a roster. So he decided he wanted to play football as a young man. His older brother Collett talked me into it and say, Dad, let him play. I said, okay, let him play. And I let him play, and it was quick. I, I saw quickly little brother had some serious talent. And so then I bought into it at that point and started helping him every step of the way. He's done some magnificent things as a young football player. He broke a lot of records as a freshman on varsity, 6'8", Texas 6'8", football. That had never been done before hmm. from anyone that's playing receiver in the county where he's playing. So I salute young brother, but he has a long, long way to go. He got to stay focused and stay disciplined. Hmm. That's the key. Focus and discipline. If you can have those two things, focus and discipline, you can go a very long way. So his chapter is still being written, but it's incumbent upon him to follow the wise counsel and advice he has received, not just from his father, but from his family, those men of our family that also act as counseling guides for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, can you tell me because... I know you've been in Houston for a while, but I was doing some research and I found out you like you're originally from California. Yeah, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Yeah, uh, I was born in L.A. Uh, my little brother Quentin, everybody knows his little toast. He too was born in Los Angeles. My older brother Quincy was born here, but then my mom quickly took him. You know, I guess angry with his pops. You know how that go, and she jetted to Los Angeles, and uh, she met my father who was Brother Akil Hanif Shabazz. May Allah be pleased with him. Now he's made his transition. He was a member, he was in fact the secretary of the Nation of Islam in Los Angeles at Mosque number 27. So she joined the Nation of Islam. And then my mom subsequently uh, had got involved in an affair uh, that my father was unaware of with a brother named Billy 2X. And Brother Billy Oh, 2X. so this is all going on all in, oh, in LA, man. yes. So Brother Billy 2X was a lieutenant in the mosque, and uh, she became pregnant. And uh, she never confided to my father the truth of the matter until Brother Billy 2X, when she was nine months pregnant, in a whole back meeting of all of the FOI and MGT, Brother um, Billy accused my mom of deceitful, being deceitful to my dad and not telling him the truth. Well, they all was wrong. Him and my mom, not my husband, not my, well, my mother's husband, but like he wasn't wrong at all. And so he brought it out then, and it was kind of dealt with in the way that the nation deals with things. And I can, never was, can I, you can you say how that goes, or is that kind of like a thing y'all keep to yourself? <laughs> well, they had broke the restrictive law, and when you break the restrictive law, especially during the time of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, there were severe consequences, brother. You just don't break the law, especially on that level, mm. and not have some severe consequences. And so, brother Billy 2X, he fled town that night. He fled that night, but he knew he only had a short window of time to get out of town, because he knew those death angels was gonna pay brother a visit, because he had had an affair with an MGT, a married sister. And, uh, it never was talked. I never knew. That's what I was going to ask you. Is that it. at this time, Until how old later are you? On, much later on. So how old are you when all this is going on? I wasn't even born yet. Oh, this before you? Oh. I wasn't even born yet. Right. This is, this is what I found out subsequently from investigating the, my roots between my father and my mother and everything. And uh, my auntie, actually, my Aunt Marie, is actually the one who told me. I was 23 years old. And she said, brother, you, she said, boy, she said, but she said, boy, you look just like your father, Billy. And I looked, I said, what? She said, you look just like Billy. I said, Emory, you just talking, you always talking. And uh, she was telling the truth. And so later on, when my mom was very sick one time, I, I brought it up to her and she told me it was true. And then uh, I hadn't spoken to my quote unquote, supposedly biological dad for 30, 33 years. And 
Last time I seen him, I was five years old when she divorced him. And at five years old, we were at the forum in LA and Imam W.D. Muhammad was speaking, the son of Elijah Muhammad. And so my mother and him was arguing and I remember him saying to my mom, I'll get me some more kids. And that was the last oh. I'd ever seen, I had never seen him again for 33 years. And then um, wait, so you're a kid, you can process this. Like, oh yeah, this I, is my dad telling my oh, mom, yeah, I he gonna yeah. just go get him. I remember, I remember, yeah, I remember. Wow. And um, I'd got a message from some Muslims in Los Angeles who had got a message to Muslims here in Houston that this brother was trying to reach me and that he was saying he was my father. And so, you know, I was, how did he reach me? Was supposed, well, I was on the cover of the Los Angeles Times. They did a cover story on me on the LA Times. And uh, he saw the story and read the story. And so he wanted to reach out, which he did. And uh, I flew him here to Houston. He was financially having some struggles. I got him an apartment, I furnished the apartment for him, got him everything that he needed, moved him close to me where I was living. And I remember saying to him, I said, I want nothing from you. All I want from you is to have a relationship with your grandchildren. Hmm. Be to them what you feel to be to us. Of course, that never, that never grew, that never matriculated. But uh, I did my part and it was, Shortly, right after he had passed, he had went back to L.A. to visit, he passed in L.A. Then at that point, my biological father, who was my real biological father, brother Billy 2X, he had family in Texas. And so they started reaching out to some Muslims, saying that, you know, Quanell's biological dad wants to meet with him and talk with him. So the first thing I did, I called my Auntie Marie, because she was the first one told me. So I asked her, I said, look, Billy's brother Billy's looking for me, blah, blah, blah. I had talked to my mom a little bit about it. And so he, my then chief of staff, he got a picture for brother and sent, and sent a picture to me. And I looked at the picture. Y'all on there looking like twins. Like, damn, you know. <laughs> I looked at my damn. So I went, to, I went to my queen at the time and I said, uh, who does this man look like, sweetie? And she instantly said, he look like you. So yeah, this is what he say he is, that kind of thing. And so uh, I had a phone conversation with him, and uh, we met. Hmm. We met, we talked for a while, and... Um, and you're at how up. old at this age, at this time? I was, I'm um, 51 now. I think I was 40, maybe 41, 42. Wow. So do y'all begin to like build right there, like catch up for last time, or it's just kind of like, okay, you're my father, I'm establishing you as my father, we both we've, know this. And we've had a lot of conversations. I visited him for a day in California, I flew to California. My son had a football event, and so we went to California, and I took some time to, to visit with him, and that was the only time I've been there. We talk periodically, he calls me, we have some discussions. He is a devout follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, still this day. He is a devout Muslim to this day. And ironically, Brother Akil, who was my father all my life that I knew, he too was a devout religious Muslim. Mm. So what's ironic is both of these men still to the moment of now and to his transition remain devout, devout Muslims. Wow, okay, so at what age, because this is five years old when you see, the, you see this conversation, when do y'all come to Houston? Like, how old do y'all when are you when you make it to Houston? Uh, we came to Houston, we came to Houston, I think, when I was like five. So around, not long five. after this time, this is when y'all make a move. Yo, Quincy, how old we come to Quincy? When we come here, man? Huh? He, my brother was looking like he's 90 years old. But. <laughs> oh, that's Quincy? Oh, man, what's up, man? What's up? Yeah, uh, Get your chill, slide that chill over here, brother. Come, come sit next to your brother, man. <laughs> you sitting over there hiding in the corner. Uh, so we, I was five. I was five when I came. So, and, okay, uh, mm -hmm. you, you get here and, because does, does your mom continue to be a Muslim when y'all move here? No. In fact, my mom had stopped being a Muslim when we were in Los Angeles. When she separated from my father and divorced my father, Akil Shabazz, my mother went back to the world. My mother went back to the streets. My mom became an alcoholic. She used a lot of drugs. 
and uh, alcohol just destroyed her life. Same with my dad. My dad's an alcoholic, so I, I understand. In fact, that. in fact, I, I haven't really said this much publicly, but the first time I ever drank beer, or smoked a marijuana, or hit a marijuana joint, I was five years old with my mother. My cousin David was there, and we had, she gave us a competition. Whoever could finish the beer can the fastest could puff the joint with him. And I was five years old. Wait, wait, this just sounds so extreme. Is, is any of this going on while y'all are in the Muslim life, or it was just a drastic no. change? No, once, once, once she left the nation of Islam, my mother, my mother completely fell. Once, once, uh, once, uh, my mother and father separated, my mother had a tremendous fall. She spiritually completely fell. She went to drugs and alcohol. She completely abandoned the teachings in the program of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And she went away from that. I can remember us growing up in the Nation of Islam school, Muhammad's University of Islam. I remember my brothers and I, we would catch the bus to the school and we would say the little Muslim nursery, nursery rhymes that we had learned. I remember that when I was five and maybe even younger, we had, a, we had Arabic teachers that would come to the house and that would teach us Arabic. Hmm. Well, my mother was a teacher. My mother was an actual teacher at the University of Islam in Los Angeles during this time. And um, we would learn Arabic. And um, they would teach us Arabic, and we went to school every day. And my mother worked downstairs. I believe it was downstairs. Wasn't it Quincy? Downstairs in the classroom downstairs. She was, a, she was a teacher. And my mother was a devout Muslim at that time. But the minute she moved away, for my father, she abandoned Islam, and my mother completely, completely fell, became a totally different woman than what she was as a Muslim. Wow, so what was the, what was the thing to say we going to Houston? My grandmother was here, my aunts, uncles were here, cousins were here. We had a big family here. We have an even bigger family in California, in Los Angeles. Hmm. But we have a big family here in Houston, so she brought us to Houston, and ultimately, I believe the real reason was she wanted her mom to help her raise her kids. Because when we got here to Houston, it was pretty quick. My grandmother was the one who became the primary caregiver and caretaker hmm. of me and my two brothers, Quincy and uh, Quentin Toast. My grandmother became the primary caretaker of us all. Wait, so Toast, it was older than you? No, he was younger. He was younger than you. Okay, right, right. right. He was the youngest boy. Gotcha. That's yeah, what he I was thought. The youngest yeah, boy yeah. of us three. Yeah. And uh, Toast, uh, he was the youngest boy. Quincy's the oldest. I'm the middle boy. But my grandmother was the one who became our primary caretaker. And my mother was pretty much running the streets. She ran the streets every day, all day, nonstop. And my grandmother was the only solid foundation that we had. My grandmother was a housekeeper. And uh, my grandmother worked as a housekeeper until physically her health declined to where she could not do that anymore. I remember that sometimes, my brother Quincy would get up every morning and walk my grandmother to the bus stop. At that time, there was a number of women in our community who would get up like 5.30 in the morning. They would all wait at the bus stop because they was catching the bus to white neighborhoods, for they were the maids and housekeepers mm. for the white people in the neighborhoods. Well, my brother Quincy would get up practically every morning and walk my grandmother to the bus stop. I walked with him every blue moon, but it was primarily Quincy who walked with her to the bus stop. And I remember she worked for a Jewish family over in uh, close to West University, West, West U. And I remember my grandmother used to get on her hands and knees and she would wipe their floors on her hands and knees in her 60s. She was in her 60s and she would wipe their floors 
Then I remember when the old white people died, the little boy that my grandmother helped raise, the little boy that my grandmother, the Jewish kid that my grandmother raised since he was born, had become a grown man. Hmm. Cause she worked for him for 40 some years. His whole life, yeah. 40 some years. He like inherited my grandmother as a housekeeper. And my grandmother, when he was in his late 20s, my grandmother would still be on her hands and knees. Same thing. Wiping the floors with a, with a cloth. She would wipe the floors. And I always, I, I remember saying to myself one time, I was like, wow, why would they leave? Why would they allow my grandmother, leave and allow my grandmother to get on her hands and knees so old? Because she had severe arthritis. Why would they allow her to get on her hands and knees like that and wipe floors? And I, um, I, didn't, I didn't understand it then as a kid, as a young boy. But I don't know if my brother Quincy remember this, but she used to let Quincy sometime go in, my grandmother. We could never go to the front door. We had to always go around to the back door. We couldn't go to the front door. And so she would let my brother Quincy go in sometime to help her wipe the floors so she could finish quicker and we could get to the bus stop and we could leave. And I remember um, one time I went in with Quincy and the white woman came home and my grandmother was nervous that the white lady would see that we were at her home. So my grandmother told my brother Quincy and I, she said, uh, before y'all walk out this house, turn your pockets inside out. And we stuck our hands in our pockets and turned them inside out. Wow. So the white woman would see that so we she didn't stole safe. anything. And that my grandmother's employment would be safe. So she wouldn't think that we had stole anything. As a kid, are you like seeing the, like what's really going on with this? Or are you just kind of like, this is just how it is when we go over here to these white people's house we got in? I'm feeling it more than I'm seeing it. Because what it's saying to me subconsciously is this white woman is of such a seat of authority and power that I have to subjugate myself to a stooping lower level to accommodate this lady because she's worthy to be accommodated. And I have to capitulate my behavior and be as meek as I possibly can because the ultimate goal, based on my grandmother's spirit, was she needs to be pleased and made to feel comfortable. So I felt it more than what I actually saw it. I didn't fully comprehend until I got much older what it is I was actually seeing. And, and this is this is what, like late 70s around this time? No, this is the 80s. Oh, you're in the 80s now. It's okay, 80s. so it, so you're how old at this time? You're getting into like almost teenager age. Yeah, you know? I'm 12, 13. So, okay, I'm glad you said that because I was talking to somebody, I was doing some research, mm -hmm. and they told me that in middle school, for talent shows, that you would speak for your talent. Like you would do like speeches or something like that. Is that, is that any truth to that? Well, I remember one time. Um, and it was a deal to where it was like, Quan Elf in a talk, we need to go hear you speak, and kids would. I like, was playing. I was making mockery. <laughs> I was making mockery of Dr. King. I was acting like Dr. King. I was making mockery. But the kids liked it. The kids liked it. And so, the, Mr. Eli Gordon, the assistant principal at Woodson Middle School, said, you know, you have the power, boy, to influence all these kids. They'll listen to you. So when they come in to the auditorium, I want you to make them be quiet. And I did. I didn't really think much about it. So what is young Quanell up there saying to these kids? <laughs> like, I'm what, still what making these, what mockery. Speeches, you know what I mean? I'm still making mockery. I'm making jokes. I mean, to me, it's, I'm having fun. But I'm going to tell you something that's, that's ironic since you bring that up. When we were in Woodson Middle School, there was something called the Houston Job Training and Partnership Association, HGP, something like that. Well, it was a program where you went to school in the summer at different sites and you went to school and they paid you to go to school. So your job was actually going to school as a teenager. Hmm. And once a month, we would have to go cut some old person's yard, do some type of community service or something like that. But they actually paid us. 
I think my brother Quincy did it for a hot minute, but I don't think he did it too long. Uh, but I stayed with it. And here's something that's ironic. So in middle school, I had two partners, the Bubba Twins. Okay, can you tell me about these guys? Because we're going to talk about all this stuff, but I'm, it's crazy you said that. So the you Bubba, went to middle school with the Bubba Twins. Yeah, Bubba Twins, yeah. So the Bubba Twins and I, we, we had classes together. And so after, after class, the Bubba Twins and myself, we never got our report cards. A brother named Lil Poochie, named Anthony Coleman. His name Lil Poochie, named Anthony Coleman. I shouldn't say the man government name. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say the man government name. <laughs> but anyway, so Lil Poochie and the Bubba Twins and I, we had a competition. Who could make the more F, most Fs on a report card? <laughs> that was our competition. We would compete who could make the most flags, the most Fs on a report card. And I made all Fs. They made Fs too. So we would, we would take we would take the report cards and ball them up and chew them and spit them out on them and spit them out as we walking away from the school. And I remember um, we, uh, we, we were so crazy. We would light up weed. We'd light up marijuana in the hallway. In middle school. In middle school. We would light up weed in middle school. And we'd blow the weed walking, walking down the hallway, just blow the weed. And Mr. Gordon, he would try to stop us, and we didn't give a damn about Mr. Gordon, what he was saying, but may God forgive him, because the man had a great heart, and may God forgive us. But Mr. Gordon was a wonderful human being. But um, we just was crazy like that in middle school. Hell, I remember one time, first time the police ever came to my house, my grandmother's house for Quincy. So Quincy decides, he's been, he got into it with some brother, some older boy at the school, big dude. And uh, I really don't recall what really happened, but I know Quincy got, got pissed, dude was bullying him. So Quincy steals my grandmother's 22 from the house. You talking about an active school shooter. <laughs> so he takes the gun to school the next day. And I'm in the back with the bubble twins. We smoking weed. <laughs> and we hear this huge commotion this at the end of school. And we hear this huge commotion and we, what's going on? Your brother didn't shot somebody, your brother shot somebody. So Quincy had shot the boy <laughs> at Woodson Middle School, the boy who he had gotten into it with. The bully. And yeah. so Quincy shoots him, I think it might have been the leg or the foot or something like that, and he runs on the, back to the house of grandmama's house. Of course, they came and arrested him, of course. And that was his first, I think that might have been Y'all his first in middle arrest. Wait, 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 I'm, I'm tri this is amazing. Y'all in middle school, you walking through the middle school blowing. Yes. Y'all shooting at the middle school. Yeah, we were. Yeah, they hit as he was. Y'all boys, y'all was something else, man. Okay, how do y'all even, how do y'all transition into this? Or it was just more so like the lifestyle, because y'all in South Acres in was, the 80s, in that was, era. It like, was the streets, man. It, it was the streets. You know, you know, South Acres in the 80s got bad. Tell me, tell me about it. But man, around 87, 86, when crack cocaine came into the game. That's the earliest you remember kind of seeing it around 86? 86. What crack cocaine did to the community, the ramifications are still very, very, very prevalent today. Crack cocaine destroyed more than just the users. Crack cocaine destroyed families took the lives of so many strong, dynamic, productive, beautiful young black men. Crack cocaine destroyed them too, and they all were not users. A lot of these brothers was hustlers. You know, it got so bad when we got to uh, the ninth grade. i never forget this. Ninth grade year, it's a place called Scott Plaza. Mm -hmm. Right behind where the school. Scott Plaza was the Wall Street of Houston for crack cocaine. And we used to leave, I'm being honest, we would leave around the first period and go to Scott Plaza with a little baggie of crack rocks. And we would come back by lunchtime with three, four thousand dollars. This 
was ninth grade. I remember. How do you even get put on though? Like, how do you get into the game? Like, okay, this is my first set of rocks, and I'm gonna like. Well, how Scarface do you even... told that truth when he started talking about Floyd, put him in the game. <laughs> but uh, my cousin, okay. my cousin okay. Floyd. Surround see, by see surround. the big cats. Yeah. The big cats that that time was cousin Floyd, cat named Poopy, uh, dude named Wayne Jefferson. Is Smitty around at this time? Mm-hmm. Wayne Jefferson was really the top. And the cats who really brought it in to them was Johnny Binder, Johnny Hickman, and Smitty was under them. So Smitty, you know, Smitty was a different caliber type cat. Yeah, see, y'all around the same age, or he's a little No, he's way older than me. He's, old, okay. he's Floyd age. Yeah, yeah. Got at least 10 years on me, I'm sure. But we were youngsters. You know, Quincy knew more about them cats than what I did because he kind of hung with Floyd more than what I did, and Floyd was always around them. But, you know, we would get all the work through them cats. We was young boys in school. And I'll never forget this. It's the honest to God truth. We get out for the Christmas break. You know, you get that two weeks out for the Christmas break. I'm still walking to school. We hustling on the corner, yeah. But I get that two week when that two week break. And I told the bubbles, I said, man, I'm not gonna party, I'm not gonna club, I'm not gonna hang out, man, I'm gonna hustle the whole two weeks. Hmm. Whole two weeks. I had hustled so much, we was buying them flippers from Scott Plaza. We was taking them back to South Acres. And we was taking the flippers mm -hmm. back to South Acres. And I was re-upping every day. You know, I could, you could take, hell, I started with $100. That's the truth, I started with $100. In two weeks, I went to a dealership and bought a BMW cash. Whoa. In two weeks. Didn't even know how to drive it. Didn't even have a driver's license. And had no clue how to drive it. So you like and, 14, 15 years old, something like that? Uh-huh, 15. And I remember when I, I remember when I get back to the house, I tell Christmas I got me a BMW. And they're like, damn fool, it's a stick shift. You don't know how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> and, wait, wait, wait. How did you get the car home? Well, hell, I burnt the clutch up getting it home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they wanted my money so bad. They let you go. They just let me go with the car. They gave me a 10-minute crash course. And so I, I think I might have drove all the way home in second gear. <laughs> but I got the car home. I got the car home and... Uh, then at that point, the money thing was crazy. I mean, partners like Kerry Moshe, she had Dirty Red and them, was he, they was heavy doing Dirty Red thing. was heavy, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back up in the Hillwood and Cloverland back up in there, man. And we had chopped up the whole sector, man. Hmm. And um, everybody was having money, everybody. I mean, I would watch Lil Poochie, I'll never forget this. Lil Poochie would buy a whole key. Damn, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm saying too much. <laughs> yeah, we good. This but, old business, man. Anybody go to jail for this? But, we good, but, yeah. But he would buy a whole key and cut the whole thing up in rocks. He would take a key. And break the whole thing down. And cut if the entire 36 ounces into rocks. Then they got hip to the B12 game. How to maximize it. Then all of a sudden they grew like muscles when you cooked it. <laughs> and... He would take that whole key, and in a day, in a day. He just sold all the rocks off the key. From Scott Plaza, he would sell the whole damn key and rocks in Scott Plaza. God damn. But it wasn't just him. There was multiple keys being sold in a day in Scott Plaza. That's how crazy Scott Plaza was. Are you even having to say anything, or is it just like, shit, I'm just out here on the block and people like want it, so they gonna come holler at me? Brother, it was like a concert out there every day. Hmm. I mean, it was like, it was madness, brother. It was absolute madness. But brothers, at that time, was strictly about the hustle. Strictly about the hustle. And then, shortly after that, came the Jack game. Is the, is the slab game and all that, like in the street? Oh, that was all full-fledged. Yeah. But really, slab game was before the crack game. 
Because that's more slap, early 80s, like slap early game, 80s. Slap games for the crack game, absolutely. Elbows and vogues and drill points and vogue tires and Ricky Ricardo seats and T-tops and Hollywoods and cut the back seat out and put your 24, 26, six by, six by nine <laughs> speakers and get you a couple of woofers and all that. Man, yeah, absolutely. But the drug game took that to another level, to a whole another level. But see, here's the flip side of that, though. Here's the flip side of that. The drug game, the drug game created a severe mental health crisis among young black men, mm. big time. Because when the brothers started robbing, Smitty had went to LA and Smitty was hanging out with brothers in LA. Well, in LA, they were kidnapping. They were really kidnapping drug dealers and they was on a whole nother level with the robbery thing. So Smitty come back, and Smitty introduced a whole nother level of hustling to the streets. He really did, man. Everybody looked up to him, and everybody feared him, too, because this was a raw gangster. This was a real cat. But here's the mental health part that it did. When you would drive to this day, I do the same thing to this day. If I'm driving, I got one eye on the road, I got another eye on the rearview mirror. Hmm. And I'm riding like this. But I always got my eye on that rearview mirror. Whenever I get to a stoplight, I'd stop and keep a great distance between me and the next car. In case you gotta move around. In case somebody jump out on you. Mm -hmm. And you gotta get out. Mm -hmm. If somebody hits you from behind, before I stop, I'm gonna make sure this is legit that this is not a robbery. Because at that point, cats was hitting the back of your car make you think it was a traffic stop. As soon as you get out, man, hmm. they keep robbing you or killing you right there on the spot. It had gotten so bad to where brothers were afraid to have sleep, sleep at night. Nobody had a sound night's sleep. We had so many of our partners were being killed and murdered to where any little noise, you would jump. If you were asleep, you would sleep so lightly, if a bird crept, you would jump. Well, what we did not know is, subconsciously, we were disrupting our internal psychological nervous system. And we were creating nervous wrecks inside of us with the paranoia that somebody might be trying to get in the house on us. And man, every week, every week somebody was dying. Every week, somebody was being killed. Every week. Are these people in the streets or, or, or any of them like super close to you? Like, man, I was just with this dude. Like, now nah, I'm starting to see my time. people starting to get killed. It was killed all the like time it. like that. These were your close partners. Man, this is, it's, this is some serious stuff. You know, man, brothers was getting robbed and Jack. You go to make a deal, it ain't no deal. These niggas finna kill They're coming to, yeah. You. Wait, so Smitty was the one responsible for bringing that game? To no, I'm not saying You're that. You're not saying that, but he But was... I'm saying them cats followed Smitty from L.A. Yeah. So you had a whole bunch of Crips that met Smitty in L.A. and saw how huge he was. And so in their minds was, well, them niggas must be having money in Houston. Mm. So he, all of a sudden, you had a bunch of cats from L.A. coming into Houston. Mm. Because they thought we was all huge like him. And everybody wasn't that big like that. But they figured, you know, shit, L.A. is hot. There's so much drama in L.A., let us go to Houston. And, man, you had Crips all over Houston. Bloods. This is the first time I've ever all heard this. I ain't know that. Oh, yeah. You, we, we were sitting in the nightclubs. Hmm. I'll never forget we was in the what, place what clubs, called, what clubs are you going to? We were in the Midnight Hour one time. A club called the Midnight Hour. And Lil Poochie got in tour with a cat in the club. And so Poochie said, I'm, I'm gonna deal with it when we, I'm gonna deal with it when we, when we leave. So as we going out, all them niggas got blue rags and they hanging from their pocket. So they get in the car, Poochie go get his, Poochie go get his stuff, you know. He finna, he finna spray it up. Poochie walk up on the car, put it back behind his back and walk off. I said, what's up, man? He said, man, every one of them niggas in that car got an Uzi on them. Mm. 
it had, it had gotten that bad, man, killing and murders were everywhere. You didn't know who to trust. You had homeboys setting up their own partners, man. You had dudes, man, in the streets who you trusted that you grew up with that were so jealous and envious of your success more than theirs. They were setting up their own partners, man, to be murdered, brother. And these were dudes who had grown, who had grown up together, man. These were cats who hung together in school, partners, tight. There was a good brother, man, who I went to Worthing with named Jimmy T. Good dude. His own partner set him up and killed him. They robbed him in his house, killed him in his house. And these were the cats he grew up with, who he went to school and hung with. That's how bad it had become, man. You didn't know who to trust. You didn't know where you could go. And I'm gonna tell you something else we never did that you see these young brothers do today. You know, like they promoting there's a party here, there's a party in this neighborhood, there's a party on this side of town. Man, we wasn't doing that unless we was going 15, 20 deep. Hmm. If we wasn't going 15 or 20 deep, we wasn't going on that. You know, they had Gucci's on the north side, club Gucci's. Well, you wasn't going to the north side unless we was deep, because if north side cats catch you over there, you're going to be a problem. Was the north and south side thing? Oh, my God. Then. It was horrible. Hmm. It was horrible, brother. It was horrible, man. Cats from the north would come over here to do their dirt on the south and go back on the north. Cats from the south would go to the north, do their dirt on the north, and come back to the south. It was horrible, brother. It was, it was, it was, it was a sad state of affairs. But at the root of all of it was the dope game. Hmm. That was at the root of all of it. How early do you meet Scarface? Man, we knew Brad growing up. We knew Brad growing up, man. You know, Brad was, Brad was another cat that's in the neighborhood, you with me? And Brad, he wasn't, he wasn't doing as much dirt as we was doing, you know? But we knew Brad from the neighborhood. We all grew up off of Hunkler, Holloway, Holloway right there, Hunkler, you know, Paradise, Richfield, you know. Uh, in Holland area, yeah. You know, those little areas right there. We was all right there. Airport, you know, everybody was raised right around there. And so, you know, Brad was, grandmother was raised, Brad was living with his grandmama. And uh, Brad was in the neighborhood. Yeah. Since we was kids. Yeah. So, okay. But at the same time, though, because are you, like, having the mind state that you have now, you know what I mean, as far as, like, having aspirations of kind of coming to this place to where you are and eventually led to, or are you just like a young street kid just in the Man, mix at the time? let me tell you something. I ain't nowhere in the world I pictured ever becoming a Muslim. And an activist? Come on now. I wasn't, that was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't even think like that. So you was, you was committed to the streets. I'm gonna tell you how I joined the Nation of Islam. So I'm riding with Quincy. We riding down Scott Street. He had just bought this big brand new white Benz. Quincy, why it wasn't Burgundy? Burgundy. Burgundy. So we smoking weed. It's a trip to hear you talk like this and I, I've only known you my whole life to be a certain type of way, but this is cool, man, go ahead. So we smoking weed and we coming down Scott Street and there's a post on the telephone pole, a light pole, I'm sorry, light pole. And it says, stop the killing, Firecon Speaks. And I say, man, Quincy, I saw that nigga on Donahue. <laughs> that nigga crazy. Mm. He was talking about them white folks, man. I ain't never heard no nigga talk to white folks like he did. I say, man, he say he coming to Houston. I say, man, I want to go. I say, what's that address? We got the address. So he and I go to the Nation of Islam. We pull up at the mosque. We pull up at the mosque. Brothers everywhere. So I go in and buy tickets. And then we, you know, we've been hustling all night, every day, that kind of thing. I buy tickets. And I went to the Sam Houston Coliseum by myself. I went by myself. I bought tickets for a few other brothers. Nobody went with me. They wouldn't go. I went downtown, then to the old Sam Houston Coliseum. And I saw Minister Farrakhan. And it blew my mind. 
everything I had heard blew my mind. And uh, blew my mind. What, what's some of the stuff do you remember that he was hitting on Man, that, really, all, that really connected to you? I had never seen black men so well-dressed and so disciplined and strong in power. I had never saw black unity like that. I didn't even think black unity even existed. When I saw the level of black unity in the nation of Islam, it was mind blowing. When I saw them brothers rolling like that in unison and they on point and they show up and everybody got a deadly serious look on their face, I was some serious shit with me. I had never seen that like that. So that was tremendously impressed me. Then when I heard Minister Farrakhan speak, man, he talked about white folks so bad. Are you are you still holding on to stuff like man? I see my grandma. Oh yeah, oh floors. yeah. I had to, all that is being regurgitated. I had to. All that's being regurgitated when I'm listening to him. He made it all make sense. So when he was speaking, he made it all make sense to streets, white people, our condition as a people, what we were dealing with with each other, how we hated each other, how we were killing each other, how we were destroying each other. He made it all make sense. And so that that night, I joined. Right there. I sure did. I joined. I called Quincy. So don't worry, the statute of limitations have run. <laughs> I called Quincy. I say, Q, I'm a Muslim now. I joined the Nation of Islam. He say, what? He say, yeah. I say, yeah, Q, I'm a Muslim now. I say, I'm done, Q. I say, I ain't selling dope no more. I say, I ain't selling dope no more. I had nine ounces left, nine ounces. Mm. I say, Q, I'm going to bring you what I got left. I say, Q, I'm going to give it to you. He say, no, corn, I'm going to give you something for I'm going to give you something for a corn. You ain't got to give it to me. I'm going to give you something for I said, no, Q. I say, I'm done. I say, I'm never going to hustle again. I'm done. I went to it. The old off Hunkler house has since burned down. My auntie's house. I gave him the nine ounces. I never touched dope again in my life to this very day. That strong. I took him the nine ounces. I gave it to him. I was done. Man, and I would I wish your brother was mic'd up, because I would <laughs> I would have asked him something, but I know I ain't gonna be able to get was, it on here. I was done. Are are people around you cause the next day, like everybody, are they looking for you on the block or what? Everybody went crazy. Hmm. They my my homeboys. Thought I had went crazy. My homeboys thought I had lost my mind. Then the other half of my partners, they say he faking. He got to be faking. He got to be, this, this, can't be, this can't be real. Maybe he just faking. It's some kind of front. So I didn't know nothing but hustling. And it had gotten so bad for me. So bad for me. I... I had no money. I had no money. And I refused to go back to the streets. So when I was living with Scarface at the time, this was 90, 93. He's already Scarface. Yes. Yeah. And I remember sitting in his studio. I had a newborn son that was born in 90, 92. My son Rashad, he's right over there. Um, I was so depressed because I couldn't see him because I didn't have no money. Because I was broke. I had no money. You know, when you're selling Final Call newspapers, you're only getting 30 cents off the paper. Mm. You sell it for a dollar, you get 30 cents. Mm. I ain't got enough money to take care of me, let's know him. So I really couldn't see him. I was a failure to my own son. And I remember sitting in um, Scarface's studio and I was so depressed. And I said to myself, man, I'm gonna get somebody to front me a package. Mm. And I'm going to give it to some brothers in the hood and let them just sell it for me. I ain't got to sell it. Just let them sell it for me. And then there's, there's, there's a voice in my mind that said, there's so many snitches out there. Come on, soon they get bust, they're going to snitch on you. And then you're going to embarrass the nation of Islam and you're going to embarrass Minister Farrakhan. They're going to use you as an example that it ain't real, it's fake. And I was like, damn, what am I going to do? I got so depressed sitting in that room, I thought about suicide. I thought about suicide, because I was so poor. And I, I remember saying to myself, suicide is against the religion. Hmm. If I commit suicide, I'll go straight to hell and burn it for eternity. 
That's what we taught in Islam. You commit suicide, you burn forever and eternity. And we're taught in Islam, however you commit suicide, when you go to hell, you'll do that over and over and over and over again, killing yourself in hell for eternity. Mm. So I was depressed. I was like, God, what am I going to do, man? What am I going to do? I, what am I going to do? The next day, a storm came through Houston. I believe it was Allison. A great flood that came through Houston. I went to the mosque, and Brother Minister Robert Muhammad, who's now Abdul Halim Muhammad, said, take some brothers, go into the community, and see if the elderly people can get out their homes, because they was all flooded in, they couldn't get out their homes. So I went, and we're working with the brothers, getting, taking, packing old people out of their homes. So this older, bright-skinned brother, he wasn't that old, he was, still, he was kind of a young man, but he was, old, he was older than me. Say, young man, come here. Say, come help me take this old man in a wheelchair out the house. So I told the brothers, come meet. We helped him out. Of the, helped him out. We went to the next house. I helped the same bright skinned man take some people to the house. And he said to me, say, brother, I like how you move. He said, I like how you work. He said, what's your name? I said, my name is Quan L. X. I'm a member of the Nation of Islam. I'm a follower of Minister Louis Farrakhan. And he said, you got a job? I said, no, sir. He said, here, take my card. Come by my office, I'm gonna give you a job. Hmm. So I look at the card. It said State Representative Ron Wilson. I didn't know what a state representative was. So I take the call with me, take it to the mosque, show it to Brother Robert. He said, oh yeah, brother. You show up and get that job. 23, I show up and get the job. Didn't know how to fill out the application. May God rest her soul in peace, a lady named Miss Melva. She helped me fill out my first application. Did all the writing for me. And uh, she said, you got a child? I say, yes. I say, his name is Quentin Rashad. I named my son Quentin after my little brother Toast. So I named him Quentin because he was born so shortly right after Toast was murdered. And uh, my first check was $785. Hmm. And uh, I hadn't seen my son in months. I hadn't seen him in months. And um, I called his mom. I said, I want to see Rashad. She said, you got some money? I said, yeah, I got some money, and I got a health insurance card for him, too. She said, come on. I went by the house. I hadn't seen Rashad, and it had been months, man, months. But my fear was he would forget me, that he wouldn't remember me. Because the last time I had talked to him on his grandparents' house, they had like a mailbox slot on the house where you put the mail, mail through, the, through the slot, and it falls on the living room floor. So I nailed down, I opened that box, and I, and I remember telling Rashad, don't forget your daddy, don't forget your daddy, I'll be back one day. I remember telling him that. And uh, through that little mailbox hole. And uh, so I get my first check, I had a health insurance card for him and I had $500. And I went over there and I gave his mom the $500 and I gave her the health insurance card. And uh, Rashad, he come out the back, he was with his Aunt Beverly at the time. and. Uh, he was chewing on the bottle top, chewing on the bottle top. And he looked up at me and I looked at him. And I'm thinking to myself, man, he don't even know me. And um, he stood there for a second, looked at me. Then he ran and jumped in my arms. Mm. He remembered his father. But I say all of that to say this. A lot of brothers are so afraid to leave the streets that they won't trust God. They're so afraid that they, don't, they will not survive, that they won't truly trust solely in God. God allowed me to go through extreme poverty when I left the streets. And how I survived was I would go to Quincy and I would get $5 from him. And I tried not to go every day because I didn't want to be a burden to him. I didn't want to be a burden to him. So I would go to him like kind of like every other day and get $5. I would go to Burger, I would go to Burger King. At that time, Whoppers were 99 cents. <laughs> and I could buy two Whoppers for $2.14. I couldn't get cheese because cheese was 40 cents a slice extra. So I couldn't get cheese. I couldn't get fries. All that was marked up. So I would buy the two Whoppers, and I would take another 79 cents from the five. 
and go to Kroger and I'll buy a BK two liter soda. Hmm. That two liter soda would last me four days. And so I was eating one meal a day because in the Nation of Islam, we were taught to eat one meal a day. So I ate that one Whopper, saved the Whopper for the next day. Five dollars I could eat for two days. I could eat for two days off five dollars. And I still like had a dollar change level. I could put that in the gas tank. And uh, that's how I survived, man, for like two years before I got that job at Ron Wilson's office. Okay, so but how do you, because your friends were Scarface, but how do you end up, because you had like a position with, with rap a lot, or, or mm -hmm. it was an official position, right? But I wasn't paid, though, because mm. I, I didn't want to take money from them. I always wanted to prove to Jay Prince and to rap a lot my value. And I felt I would cheapen myself if I would ask for a check. I wanted to prove just how valuable I was. And one thing that Jay Prince always paid close attention to and he was always impressed by was discipline and loyalty. He was always impressed by discipline and loyalty. And I remember one time I heard him say, Quan, a real nigga's hard to find. Hmm. And he was the first man, Jay Prince was the first man to tell me that I would be successful and how it would happen. I had no clue. What, what is he telling you? For, no okay, clue. first, before we do that, when you go over there, what is your role and what are the things you bring into the table? It wasn't know? planned. I just happened to go to school with Scarface up to rap a lot. They was, on a, they was on an interview with some source magazine and they was jumping on rap, well, they were jumping on the Ghetto Boys about some of their lyrics. And so they were condemning them about their lyrics and I just started answering the questions for them. I was just teaching. Hmm. You know, you blame the black man for this, but you don't point the white man as direct involvement. You blame the white man, but you don't blame Arnold Schwarzenegger when he'd make a movie killing everybody, that kind of thing. And so they were very impressed that I had acquired such a knowledge in the nation of Islam. But during that time, I was still going to Cuba. Getting that five dollars hmm. to eat off of. When well, we seeing you in these videos and all that, you still wanna, going to get exactly. that. Exactly. When I'm in the videos that she was looking at, I'm still getting five dollars from Quincy to eat off of. It wasn't taking money from Brad, wasn't taking money from Rap Lot, but I was traveling with him. I was traveling with him, speaking at all the concerts. But I did not realize what God was doing for me through Jay. Jay gave me the platform. Before anybody gave me a national platform, Jay Prince gave it to me and allowed me to speak and teach at those concerts. And I'll never forget, I was sitting with him like we sitting here. And we was having dinner at his grandmother's house, him and I. And I was telling him how hard it was for me financially. And uh, I'll never forget what he told me. He said, Quan, it ain't your time yet. Hmm. He said, Quan, it ain't your time yet but keep doing what you're doing and your time will come. He said, pressure busts pipes. Mm. Keep applying pressure and brother, you'll be rich one day. I didn't necessarily believe what he said, but I felt what he said. I felt it. Man, it wasn't two years after that. I'm now administrative assistant to a state, a sitting state elected official. Which is crazy because just a few years ago you were selling crack, you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> like, and that's when I learned the real game. Hmm. I learned the real game then in politics. Then that's when I realized just how ignorant we had been played in the streets. We had been convinced in the streets that the dope game was the real hustle. That wasn't the real hustle, brother. As an employee, an aide to a state, to a sitting state elected official, I saw how white men, at that time affirmative action was a big thing. So they would take, these white boys couldn't be a part of affirmative action because they were white males. But they were slick. They got white females included with black people mm. as minorities. So it was called minority set-asides, minority contracts, minority vendorships. So the white boy could not bid on himself. He would use his wife to get the contract because she's considered a minority next to black people. So here it is, you would have a $80 million contract. 
his wife would get 15% of the $80 million contract. You know how much money that is? Yeah. We couldn't make that kind of money in the streets. But I saw these white guys would take a white girl who was blonde, had beautiful blue eyes, but didn't know a construction hole from a hole in the ground, hmm. and was dumb as a box of rocks, and she just got a $20 million deal, a $10 million deal. We didn't make that kind of money in the streets. Man, the biggest ones of us were making that kind of money. And I'm like, damn, this one deal. And they were moving all them deals around like that. So I was waking up. I was waking up. Then I read a book. I was told to read by, written, by, written, uh, written about Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson called Shakedown Man, exposing the real Jesse Jackson. His enemies wrote the book about it. Then that's when I learned, damn, Jesse Jackson owned the Budweiser distribution plant. Not one, but two. Oh, wow. I'm like, whoa, this is heavy. Then I saw where he was involved with Burger King and owned all these franchises. I'm like, man, what the hell? And that was happening through the minority vendorship. Oh, wow. You with me? <laughs> so he was broking the deal, but being wise at the same time, don't broke a deal for everybody else and you, you don't, don't eat. Get it, yeah, yeah. So he had to make sure that as he's making other millionaires, he himself eats too. So I'm reading this book. I read that book in two days. Hmm. That thick damn book, I read it in two days. And as I'm sitting here, my brother will tell you, you know what my first business was I bought? Hmm. I bought a $2 million gas station in Texaco. Oh, yeah. People don't even know this stuff. I never talk about it. Never talk about what, it. What year is this when you bought a Texaco? This was in 99. Damn. And the reason why I never publicly talked about it because I knew white people hated me so much. If they really knew my business investments, they would seek to sabotage and destroy it. Many people don't even know this. The Domino's pizza off of Cullen. Yeah. That we grew up, we couldn't eat from. We couldn't even afford to eat from. I bought that Domino's pizza. It was mine. Same when I would walk by going to school, to Worthing High School. Same when I would walk by going to Worthing High School. People didn't even know I had bought it in 2000. Oh, and I had a deal with Domino's to develop 15. So what I did, I took other businessmen that I had met through politics and brought them in on a deal with me. And I got involved in Domino's Pizza as the first African-American franchise owners in Texas. Wow. Then after that, uh, there was a problem with racism and how they was treating black females at Mercedes-Benz of Houston. That's when I learned Mercedes-Benz of Houston was actually owned by AutoNation. Mm. Then that's when I learned that the owner of AutoNation was Wayne Hosinger, the owner of the Miami Dolphins. Oh, man. So I told the women, I'm going to help you all get your settlements and get paid, but I don't want y'all to pay me. I said, I'm going to make them pay me. So, a gentleman, beautiful, beautiful black brother out of North Carolina was their rep. His name was Frankie. Dude named Frankie. Intelligent black man. He and I would talk for hours. He would teach me. So he told me, he said, Quanell, I see myself in you. So I'm going to tell you something I ain't never told nobody. I'm going to give you the scoop in the game how to do this. He told me how to deal with AutoNation. He was working for AutoNation. They had him talking to me to calm me down and to stop me from going crazy on them. They had hired him to be the man to go around the country calming niggas down. They had hired him to be the man to go around the country suppressing anger against white folks and Mercedes Benz. But they did not know this brother. And I pray to God he ain't working for him no more. I don't know, but it's been so long ago. The brother taught me everything. So, Mercedes Benz AutoNation said, well, Quanell, we would like to donate a 
donation, sizable donation to you. And um, we appreciate how you have really helped our company diversify. Hmm. I said, well, no, 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 no. I don't want no donation. I don't want no donation. But I'm going to make sure you give black media outlets the donation. Hmm. So I made them give 50 grand to 1430 KCOH. I made them give money to Houston Defender. I made them give money to, uh, at that time, the Forward Times. I made them spread the money out. Then I told them, I said, nah, I want to take over your diversity training for our donation. I went and got another brother and sister who was great in diversity and uh, gave them the contract. But of course, I was the vendor for the contract. What I wound up earning and making was 10 times what they wanted to give me in a donation. Hmm. So I'm just telling you things I've never really talked about. Never really talked about at all. And that's just being in the mix, just getting this game, getting. <clears throat> I remember I opened a ch chain of hot wings franchises called Casey's Hot Wings and More. This was 2003, 2004. This was the beginning of Wingstop. But Wingstop did not want us being a competitor. They wanted territorial rights. And white folks, they're real territorial. So they wanted territorial rights. So I, uh, they didn't know my franchises were failing because we didn't know the business side of it that well, but they didn't know that. So I told myself, okay, I'll shut down all my businesses, but I want a percentage of ownership in every one you open up in your quote unquote territory where I already mm. exist. Mm. They gave me the deal. That's just some of it, and we can move on. Wow, okay, man. So when, when does it become this thing? Because it's like, you know, people get in these binds, they get in these situations, you see them on the news, and it's like, they, we're gonna call Quinell. You know, what is the, what is the, why do people come to you in times of crisis? Well, I've been able, by God's grace, to do things that no other activist or black leader in the history of this city has ever been able to do. I've been able to do things that many people have called miracles but this is what they don't really understand. Everything I, I've told you that I did, you know why I learned that? Hmm. The Nation of Islam. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Those deals I made, it was his wisdom that I learned in the Nation of Islam that put me on that type of frame, thought process to make that type of stuff happen to become a reality. Hmm. When brothers have confessed to me cold-blooded murders that they've done that the FBI could have those brothers 18 hours and straight and don't let them sleep in question. We couldn't get enough out of them. Everything that I was able to do we getting those confessions all across the country were the techniques I learned in the Nation of Islam. Okay, because I don't, I, don't, I don't want, I know we can't get that type of game out, but like, if you can in a sense, like, what is, like, what is that? What is that? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the human thought travels at 24 billion miles per second. But thought is the motivating force that produces a living reality or hinders a reality from coming into existence. Christ Jesus taught as a man, think it, so is he. The power of the human mind is so dynamic, so in-depth, if you take a human being that is an astute student of knowledge and they go into the inner sanctum of the inner sanctorium of their subconscious thinking, you can read people's minds. Hmm. And so when a brother is lying to you, you could finish the lie before you ever finish it. Hmm. And then you can tell him what a lie thought came from. And when a man sees that you're reading his thoughts. We gotta deal with the truth. Yeah. You know what, man? I remember when the Malia Davis situation was going on. I think that's one that probably your name is going to be synonymous with, you know, for a long time, man. How, 
how real was that to go in because it was like you were on one side and then it came out to be a whole other thing? Like, how does that place, you know what I mean? What is it? What effect does that have on you when you I say, was, man, I these was, people trusted me to do I this? Was, and, I was always on Malia's side. Hmm. People were condemning me. People were throwing stones and rocks at me because they thought I had sided with the mother. But Jesus taught us, be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. Hmm. They don't understand that I had to make sure that my methodology was as such that at the end of the day, I would find out where that baby was. And so I had to take the slander and the attacks of the people who did not understand, who were too spiritually and psychologically immature to understand when God is working on a human being's mind to produce an end result because you don't understand, you judge it incorrectly, you cast positions and take positions on it incorrectly for a lack of knowledge. But I couldn't just come out and say, y'all don't know, this is why I'm doing what, I, I couldn't do that. Because I knew if I did, I would never find that baby. Hmm. But I always knew, I always knew I would find that baby. I remember I told little Quanell, because he asked me, he was a little younger, yeah, a couple of years ago. He said, Daddy, you gonna find that baby? I said, son, I promise you, within a week I'll find her. Hmm. Days would go by and he would say, Dad, you find her yet? I said, don't worry, son, I'm gonna find her. And in six days, I found her. Man, this is, see, this is one thing I've always wondered. There was wondered. another case similar to that, the Randy Sylvester case. Yeah. Brother of Pasadena, who mm -hmm. said somebody kidnapped his son and his daughter, and come to find out, he put him in a briefcase and burnt him alive. I went through the same thing with him. I went through the same thing with him. And my daughter, Lauren, Lauren kept asking me, Dad, are you going to find her? Are you going to find her? And I remember one day I came home early from being with Randy Sylvester. I just was tired of him. I went home. And I'll never forget this. My daughter, Lauren, was there at the house. She was a little girl. And she said, Daddy, did you find those kids? I said, no, not yet, baby. She said, well, why are you home? Hmm. And it hit, me, it, it hit me like a lightning bolt. I called the detective and said, look, I, I'm coming back. I'm, I'm coming back. I went back because he, he kept asking for me and I wouldn't go back. I went back and I sat down with him. And in 30 minutes, I had all the truth. Wow. That was God, that was God talking to me through my daughter, my ch child, a seven-year-old child saying, well, why are you home? Get back on your post, brother, and finish the mission. Hmm. When you, because you're always so close to these things. Do, these, do any of these situations ever, like, live with you? You know what I oh, mean? Oh, man, oh, brother. Because that's what, when I see that, I see them, I'm like, man, how do you live with oh, this? Oh, brother, brother. I'm going to tell you something. People know this. When I found those two children, Randy Sylvester's children, he made me see it. And I kept saying to him, we can stop, brother. Just point where it is. Just point where it is. He said, nah, I want you to see it. So we walked a little further. And I said, brother, just point me in a direction and we can just tell him to go find the kids. He said, nah, don't you want to see it? And it's I, just you and him out there. Just him and I. And we walked further into the darkness. It was pitch black dark out there. He said, right there. I said, where? I'm looking at a briefcase. It was burnt up. And he said, look. And I looked. And he said, open the shit. And I tipped it open. And I saw two skulls. And I saw the worms. I saw the worms. And I collapsed to my knees and said, oh, man. I'm like, man, what did you do? He didn't say nothing. I said, man, what, what the fuck did you do? What you do? But I was breathing in some type of chemical that comes from decomposing bodies. I was breathing the chemical. 
I got so sick, I developed a severe case of bronchitis. I was terribly ill. I had no health insurance. I had no health insurance. And I reached out to Boris Miles, State Senator Boris Miles, and said, man, I need a black doctor that'll help me. He told me to call Dr. Edith Irby in Third Ward, a historical black figure, black female doctor. Doctor, I went to her office. She diagnosed me with what I had. She treated me for free. Gave me all my medications for free. And I got back healthy. But you know you live with that stuff, brother. You, you don't forget, man. I've had so many of those type of confessions to where it, it, it gets to you, brother. It, Does, it, has it, one stood out more than the other one where you're like, man, I, I can't believe or I will never forget this the, particular The Randy condition. Sylvester and uh, the Malia Davis case, those two. Randy Sylvester and Malia, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Because the Malia Davis case gave me the toughest run for my life. I mean, that was a treadmill, but that was on a psychological treadmill 24-7. Yeah. I mean, tough, man. It was, that was a tough one, brother. Yeah. But I just kept pushing. And I knew I would get there eventually, but it was, it was, it was hard, brother. Yeah. It was hard, especially when I saw the mother. She never cried when the cameras was off. Mm. When the cameras were not running, her only concern was him. And you peeping all this. Her only concern was him. It was never Malia when the cameras were rolling. That's the facts, brother. My God. Okay. Switching, switching and gears. And we ran out of time here, brother. No, 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 no. We still good. Time. No, 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 no. We good. This is good. This is good. Make you give them some more money in a minute, brother. <laughs> no, no. It's a couple of things we're gonna hit on real quick, uh, and then we will get up out of here. Um, face off. On Fox, man. I used to love to sit down and watch that, man. That's something that my mom put me on. And one day I happened to be over there and she's watching it. And I'm like, what is this? And she's like, Quan Alex, this guy? And I sat down and I said, and every week I found myself sitting there watching it like, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to Face Off, man. Talk about that, man. I did Face Off for 11 years. Yeah. And near the end, I just got so tired. Face Off was not an easy show to do. It was a very, very hard show to do. How real was that? Because it would be, no, it, it, would, it, would real, be it looks hella intense, was, you know what I mean? Was, it was real when we discussed the subject matter. Everything was cool. Everything was kosher until we start discussing the subject matter. Because see, when you start discussing the subject matter, people's true and motivations and true beliefs and true feelings and concepts come out. And when that stuff would come out, then it's real. I mean, it's super real. Now, because of your damn racism coming out, hmm. your bigotry coming out. And brother, we never hung out. When do we go on to lunch and we go to dinner and come by for breakfast? None of that. Never. We dealt with each other in the studio. Hmm. That was it. We never no home, never no cool partnership like that. What I did admire about Matt Patrick was how loyal he was to his family. That's one thing I admire about Matt Patrick. He was super, super loyal to his family, man. And he would always ask me, how are your children? And he was sincere, because he was so about family. Most of them cats, man, behind closed doors, you'll be surprised. Hmm. Them cats got all kind of crazy shit going on. But he was a man that was always behind closed doors the same way he was in public. He was absolutely 1,000% about his family. And I really admired that about him. I really did. Yeah. Yeah, man, we kind of we kind of breezed past this earlier, but a little bit uh, just about your brother Toast. Uh, it came up on the podcast once. I had a lump on here. And he, he's probably the only person maybe touching. I had stick one on here. He might have talked about it a little bit. But your brother Toast, man, um, just the influence that he had on the South Side, you know what I mean? Just the type of figure he was. And then the unfortunate you know, situation that happened, you know, with his death and everything. Can you just speak about just your brother on just him as a person, what type of personality and like his influence and everything, and then, you know, just the last, uh, last well, moment. Well, 
We were real comfortable to this point. That was such a devastating moment that it's lasted a lifetime for our family. Toast was always a, a little different to me and Quincy. Toast, he, his, he was cool with everybody. Toast would smoke weed with everybody. Toast just, he, he was cool, didn't have a bad bone in him, man. He just was cool with everybody. And uh, one time Toast shot my car. <laughs> oh, an accident, I'm imagining. Well, y'all was y'all had purpose. <laughs> because he and I got into it, because he had a bunch of strange dudes in his house. And I loved my brother so much. You say strange, what you mean? Like you just felt they were questionable characters? Uh, or? Yeah, yeah, I knew they was questionable characters. Yeah. And he would have these strange dudes in the house smoking weed with him. And me and Quincy knew them cats just wasn't to be trusted. We knew that. But see, Tosi had grew up under us. He had never really kind of did what we did, you know? He just was cool with the hustling side of it. So Tosh, I go over there one day and, and I knew death was in the house. So I cussed us, I cussed him out. And I with made, the guys over there. And I made them niggas leave, right? So Tosh get mad, you know, he get mad and grab the gun and shoot down on the ground, but he shot the car. Because I made all them cats leave. So Quincy and I, we talk about it. Quincy got on toast. Because Quincy had been getting on toast about the same thing. Keep these, I'm just gonna keep it real. Let's go real. You know, I'm just gonna be straight. Keep these strange niggas out your house. These niggas will kill you, man. These niggas will set you up. We kept telling toast that. They had a history of this, or uh, no, this, this was the streets. Yeah, yeah. Shit, this how this how it go. Yeah, this yeah. how it was going down. This this is this is what was happening. This is the this was the norm of the day, killing and jacking and robbing. But we kept arguing with him about these strange dudes always at his place. We kept arguing with him, keep these strange dudes from your house. And um, we could see it coming. We just never imagined to that magnitude. And um, I was sitting in the barbershop. And uh, my brother Quincy bust in the barbershop real fast. Quincy had tears in his eyes. I had never seen Quincy cry a day in my life. And all of the madness we had been through as young people and young boys and teenagers, I had never, it's not even going to jail, I didn't see Quincy cry not one time in his life. And he walked in that barbershop and he had tears rolling down his eyes. I said, Q, what's wrong, man? He said, man, somebody done killed Toast and everybody in the house. So I snatch off, I snatch off the, uh, the apron, and I wasn't sure if I jumped in the car with him or followed him down there, but we went to the house. He had already broke the window out the side of the house, because he had been bamming on the door, bamming on the door, bamming on the door, trying to get in there. And I think he had been calling Toast, and Toast wouldn't answer the phone. He had been calling Toast, and he wouldn't answer the phone, so he, Bamming, bamming, bamming on the door. He decided to look at me and he ain't answering the phone. So we automatically knew, your brother ain't answering the phone. Get over there, because something's up. So he went, you know, he had broke out the window. One of them had already went in there and uh, uh, Toast was already dead. His girlfriend, his girlfriend Lori was in the bed, she was dead. Rob, another good friend of ours, told us he was sitting on the sofa. And Rob was sitting like this, 
And he had his hands folded like this with his head tilt. He had his hands inside of his shirt because it was cold from the AC. And uh, the back of his head was blowed off. And uh, another little partner. Wow. What? Charles? Jonathan. Jonathan was uh, laying on the sofa with a sheet up to his neck like this, with his head tilted to the side. The whole side of his face was missing. What had happened, they died in their sleep. They died in their sleep. They never woke up. They never even, they, they, they was killed while they were sleeping. So, uh, we and the were, house is locked when y'all got, so you had to go, yeah. So cats took the keys and locked the door behind them. So, when I, uh, we go in the room, we see Lori in the bed. She had her hands on her face like this. Because whoever had hit it, whoever had did it, she threw her hands up like this. Went for there and shot her. Uh, Toast was laying on the floor. He was like on his side. And I remember I walked over to him. And I bent over him, and I said, uh, I said, oh, bruh. I said, bruh. I said, Toast, wake up, Toast. I said, wake up, bruh, wake up. And, uh, shit. Uh, -uh. I hugged him, I hugged him. And I'm gonna tell you something I, I've not said before. I think I just told my nephew Chris about this. And Tosa's son is here. I had a black silk shirt on. And when I hugged him, there was, there was so much blood. I got blood stains all over the black silk shirt. That same shirt is hanging in my closet to this day. Hmm. And I never even told his kids I had that shirt. That I still have it. And I've, I've often said to myself, wonder, should I tell them that I have that shirt with their father's blood all over it? And um, I, I, I told Chris, I said, I'm going to give it to one of them one day. If they want it, I'm going to give it to them because it's, it's, it's their right to have. It's the only thing left for their father. And they don't even know him. They were so young. And, uh, but the cats that did it. So, so y'all didn't call the police when this happened? Y'all... No, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't roll like that. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't the time for the police at that moment. Yeah. Uh, the cats that did it, they knew they had to kill everybody in the house. They knew it. They knew they couldn't leave one witness. They knew it. Because if we would have had just a shred. Just a shred. Everything with your DNA would have disappeared. And that ain't a threat, that's a promise. So they knew, they knew we had to finish everything in there. <sighs> Did, because it, from my understanding, somebody came forward, like, later, 
years okay. later. Thank you, son. Uh, yeah, somebody came forward and we found out. Is it who you suspected at the time when you went over there and was like, these guys ain't? Well, two of the brothers who was charged had nothing to do with it. They just was through in it. Hmm. But we, we knew, uh, yeah, the brother who did it. I'm gonna tell you how dirty the government of the United States is. They tried to indict me, saying that I ordered the Muslims to assassinate the man who was charged with my little brother's murder. And they went to two Muslims, one who had a life sentence, one who had a 30-year sentence. They went to them and told them that if you just give us a signed affidavit, that the Quan X gave you the order to kill this man, we will take you as a state's witness, put you in witness protection, and we'll terminate your sentence. Mm. And the one brother they went to had a life sentence. And that brother, I read his statement. He told him, he said, La a illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Before I lie on Brother Cornell, I'll do another life sentence. Hmm. Them two brothers stood strong. Those two brothers stood strong. For the federal government wanted to charge me with conspiracy to commit murder in retaliation for the murder of my little brother. And I had never even had a conversation with them brothers. Hmm. I had never had a conversation with either one of them brothers. That's how low down these people are, brother. Yeah, that's tough. That's, that's tough. That's tough. Wow. So you were saying, but one of the guys, he, he actually was responsible. Yes. Have you ever had any conversation? No comment. No. Let's make that clear. Yeah. I have no comment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, um, man, before we get up out of here, we got a brand new year, it's a fresh year. Uh, we're still in the middle of the pandemic and all of that. What is the message for the black man moving forward for this year? What you got for us? I would say to brothers, we are being played, brother. And where's what the scripture says, we're like, we're like sheep being led to the slaughter. So I want to warn all the brothers who like killing each other, who like hating on each other, who like plotting each other's demise and downfall. Why you sitting around straining at a gnat, these damn devils got you swallowing a camel at the same time. Hmm. You better wake up and realize we are all we got. And when this thing go down, all we got is one another. But if we so busy hating each other and destroying and killing each other, we're not gonna survive it, brother. So that's my warning to them. If you think God ain't real, keep doing your thing. Hmm. If you think the word of God is a joke, keep doing what you do. But God is real. And Satan is just as real. And for those of you who don't believe in Satan, trust me, he damn sure believe in you. Hmm. We gotta get back right with God, brother. Because we're now living in a time without him, brother, we not gonna make it. I said, brother, anything else you want to talk to me about? I said, man, this is amazing, man. I appreciate you I taking time. I think you might have the rawest conversation with me that I've ever given to somebody. Yeah, thank brother. you, man. Pleasure talking with you, brother. Excuse my seat. Thank you. Indeed, it was an honor, brother. Yeah, nah, I thank sure. my nephew, Chris. Yeah, Chris, shout out Chris, man. We've been trying to set this up for a while. We got it, it was together. It really his idea to do this. <laughs> <laughs> he really pushed this thing. But I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, may Allah bless you, brother, to be successful. Yeah.
and take care of yourself, man. Indeed, it was a pleasure. Thank you, man. Listen, it's the Donnie Houston Podcast. It's Quan LX. Hey, man, we out of here.